So I thought I would lay this out um, a little bit in an agenda to try and break it down and, and make it a bit clearer. I'm going to tell you a little bit about stem cells. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nervous system in general. And the reason to do that is to set up the context really for spinal cord injury and what goes wrong and why we thought that any kind of stem cell therapy might be able to have some utility in this um, indication. And then really the meat of the talk is going to be in this question is, is timing everything? Is it possible that we can think about transplanting from an early to a late period and still see repair? And how do we think about scaling that up from the animal models that we use to being able to go into the clinic to treating humans that have spinal cord injury? There we go. So stem cell 101. Um, you may or may not have heard some of this yesterday. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here. Um, but I just want to give a little bit of a basic background on this. And uh, to define a stem cell, stem cells are undifferentiated cells that divide. They divide by a mitosis, which is what most of the cells in your body divide by, and they make daughter cells. And those daughter cells can go on to do one of two things, or potentially one each. They either differentiate, that means they make an adult cell, like an adult skin cell, or they remain as a stem cell. And the reason they would want to do that is we need to keep a pool of stem cells going. Now, this is actually quite remarkable. At the time that I was in graduate school, which was in the early 90s, it really wasn't recognized that your body, at least the adult brain and spinal cord, still had stem cells. This was really unknown territory. And that's, that's quite important because that means that really in less than 20 years, we've gone from not knowing that something to exists to actually bringing it through, looking at the potential to repair an indication like spinal cord injury, demyelination, and all the way on through to clinical trials. That's an incredibly fast pace um, for any kind of research. And it has a lot to do in California, as was just highlighted for you guys, with the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and funding for CIRM, being able to drive sufficient funding at these kinds of questions to really um, get to the point where we can change the dynamic. So I want to point out one more thing, which is this tree. Sorry, it's hard to talk in two directions at once. And this is kind of a way to think about stem cells. Stem cells have different potentials depending upon where they come from and where they are. And we can envision that as being a part of this tree. Cells that are more potent, in other words, can make more things, would be at the trunk. This would include like embryonic stem cells, because an embryonic stem cell can make any cell that's in your body. As we go up the branches, these cells become more and more differentiated, more mature, more like the adult tissues that are there. So for example, those three major divisions would be endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And for example, a neural stem cell that might contribute to the cells that are in your brain or spinal cord would be partway up one of those branches. It would be along the ectodermal lineage, but part of the, uh, a neural stem cell lineage. That means it's multipotent. It can't make any cell in your body. It can only make the cells that are present in the brain and spinal cord. And for us, that's really three cell types in terms of what we want to think about. It's neurons, which make up essentially the wiring of your nervous system. It's oligodendrocytes, which are like the insulation around that wiring. So if you think about your house, for example, you have wires that connect the you know, power supply, the power grid coming in from the city on into your lights, your microwave, your refrigerator, whatever. Those wires don't work very efficiently unless they're insulated. There's plastic around them, right? And that plastic, that insulation is made up by the oligodendrocytes. And so those two cells working together are really very critical in order to keep your brain and spinal cord working prop properly. The third cell type that's present in the central nervous system is called an astrocyte. These have largely been thought of as being support cells, but we now know they do a lot more complex things. Um, but we can think of them in that way for our purpose today. So neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes are the three cells I'm going to be talking about. And the neural stem cells that we've worked with in the lab can make those three cell types, but not anything else. So spinal cord injury 101, this is a domain that I think probably most of you are familiar with to a greater or lesser degree. And I just want to make a couple of points here briefly in terms of what goes wrong with spinal cord injury and put that in the context of thinking about stem cells. So this is an example of an MRI from a human with a spinal cord injury. This dark region at the very center is the place where the hole is, the syrinx is. That's the primary site of trauma in this particular case. So you can see that there's a little bit of spared tissue on each side, but fundamentally the issue that we have in spinal cord injury is there's a disconnection. 
right? Signals that should flow from the brain down to the muscles can't get there. And conversely, sensory information that should come from the skin, from your muscles, to tell you where you are in space, that kind of thing, from below the level of the injury can't get back to the brain. So that communication, being able to send signals up and down the spinal cord has been disconnected, just like cutting a wire or damaging a wire in your house. The other key point I want to make here is that this is a dynamic process. What happens on the first day of an injury doesn't yield a spinal cord that looks the same a week later or a month later or a year later. It changes over time. And it's changing because the central nervous system, the cells that are there, are trying to do as much repair as they can. And it's changing because there are a lot of other processes that come into play. Inflammation would be an example. So inflammation is a great example of something that is around heavily after spinal cord injury. But even within that, the players that are present in the first days and weeks are not the same players that are present months or years later. They're still an inflammatory process, but it's been dynamic. It's changed over time. So what about thinking about stem cells then? So um, you got a little bit of a context um, from John Thomas, the previous talk, about stem cells in the global context of all the things that we hope they might be able to do for injury and disease, particularly in the central nervous system. But really this is work that's grounded um, back in the idea of replacement cells. And much of this came out of the Parkinson's literature 20 or 30 years ago, with the idea where a very defined cell population, dopaminergic cells, go missing. And when you start to miss enough of them, you have symptoms that impair motor ability, impair one's ability to be able to get around or initiate movement. And so long ago, many investigators had the idea of replacing those cells. If we could just replace them, then everything would be fixed. So much of the concept of thinking about stem cells and using it for things like spinal cord injury or other diseases comes around the idea of just making a new adult cell and fixing things up that way, replacing what's been lost. The catch is, it hasn't always been considered whether we really need to have replacement cells. There are many other things that transplanted cells can do in terms of the environment that they land in. Um, just some of them are listed here. They might be able to help the body reorganize its own circuitry. They might be able to help modify a glial scar, the inflammatory process that's there. They might supply trophic support and increase the amount of stimulation that's present, just improving the function of what's been spared. And in fact, we now know that many stem cell populations do these things. And they might, for example, actually change the stem cells that we now know you have in your brain and spinal cord and recruit them to the area of injury, make them work better, yield repair, not by the cell that we transplanted, but by activating your own body to do the job. So we need to think about all these different mechanisms in terms of understanding what we're doing by virtue of the stem cell transplants we give. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, though, that we need to have some element of replacement cells. And I'm going to talk about that in the context of the neural stem cells that we've used. If we assume that, then what do we need from those cells? And we really need to ask that question in order to think about designing a good translational therapeutic, something that might have the opportunity, the chance for success in the clinic. Well, we need those cells to live after we transplant them, right? If we're really trying to replace something, we need them to survive once we put them in the place we want them to be. In the case of spinal cord injury, if you look down here at this diagram, it's there to illustrate the idea that there's a primary epicenter, but there may be effects in that environment far upstream and downstream. And one of the things that may happen, there's a little bit of debate, but probably does happen in spinal cord injury, is that we lose the insulation of the fibers that are even far away from the point of injury. If we lose that insulation, if we lose those oligodendrocytes, we may lose the ability to conduct a signal to send messages up and down the spinal cord. So replacing that insulation may require the cells that we transplant to really be able to migrate quite far. And that's a trick that not all stem cells can do. So then we need to think about the cell populations that we're considering for transplants. We may need, um, uh, we certainly need these cells to see the niche, see the environment that we put them in, in a beneficial way, right? That's not rocket science. We need them potentially to look around at the sites that they've found and do something that's positive, not something that's negative. And from the context of translational research, we need to be very careful in our thinking about that. We need to look at that very closely because the last thing that we want to do is take someone who's at a stable level and make them worse. Right? And that's what safety trials are all about. That's what a phase one trial is. We do a lot of animal work to back that up, but we also need to be looking at that very closely when we get to the point of translation. Of course, we need 
these cells to make things better if we're going to go down this path, right? And the fundamental idea here is do no harm. So that's part of the game, but if we're going to go incur the risk of transplanting a cell population, we need those cells to actually yield enough benefit to make it logical, to make it worthwhile to take the risk of transplanting them. So there's three factors that I've highlighted here, nature, nurture, and niche. Um, that I think really define many of things. So nature of the cells, the kind of cell population we're starting with, is it pluripotent, is it multipotent, has it already been differentiated into an adult population? The nurture of those cells, what do we do with them in a dish before we actually transplant them? And that turns out to be an incredibly important variable, especially at the point where you're thinking about going to clinical trial. And the niche, the environment that we put those cells in. And I'm gonna spend uh, most of the rest of the time I'm talking uh, today about that. And there are a couple of domains that research, research in my lab in particular, the injury niche and the inflammatory niche. And I'm gonna focus not so much on these words but upon the concept of timing that goes behind them, and I'll come to that in a minute. So a quick word about the neural stem cells um, that we used in this particular set of studies I'm gonna tell you about. Again, these were derived by Nobuko Uchida at Stem Cells Inc. Um, that's been this uh, great collaboration that I've told you about. These cells are um, derived from 16 to 20 week gestation human fetal brain. So they're tissue educated cells. That's what makes them multipotent. Now we think that's quite important because these cells are educated down a particular path ahead of time, but they're still flexible in terms of what they can become. We work with a lot of different cell populations in my lab. I can tell you we have 13 different embryonic and induced pluripotent or reprogrammed cells in my lab um, that we're doing research with currently. None of them behave the way that these cells do. I can tell you that in terms of our in vitro work and our transplant work. There is something about that pre-tissue education that has an enormous impact. These cells are fact sorted um, based on cell surface markers. And what this accomplishes here is to enrich for a neural stem cell population by about 2,000 folds, 2,000 times enrichment. Selects against hematopoietic cells or contaminants, but enriches for this neural stem cell population. And then this, the rest is just to tell you that these cells all have the characteristics of stem cells, which is what we want them to do. Okay. So, is timing everything? And this is really where I'm gonna focus um, kind of the basic background for our, our thinking. What um, I have here is a, an image from a diagram. It's a little bit cut off on the bottom. It was published um, by Hideyuki Okano, who's a very well-known neural stem cell researcher in Japan in 2003. And it was really a review of the literature as he was starting this work in his lab. And he made a very cogent case, a very logical case about when you should do stem cell transplantation. But he did it based on the historical literature, and so I'm just gonna explain that to you briefly. He said early on, after spinal cord injury, his lab focuses all on spinal cord injury work, he said early on, there's a lot of inflammation around. And if you transplant cells, then they won't survive, right? We said we need them to survive, so this would be a terrible time to transplant. And he said later on, by the time you get out to two weeks or so after injury, there's a lot of scar present. There's an astroglial scar, there are proteoglycans there, there's all kinds of processes going on in this dynamic environment that will keep them from being able to get around and survive. And so that would be a terrible time to transplant. His argument was completely logical and rational. I'm not quibbling with it. But he basically came along and he said, you should transplant between seven and 10 days post-injury. And every other person who did spinal cord injury research for the next five or six years did that. That is the time that they picked for transplantation based on this completely logical argument. The catch is this. If you think about it, um, there are some downsides with transplanting only in that subacute period. One of them that was emerging at this time in the literature and which we rather carefully considered is there's a lot of what's called spontaneous conversion in the human clinical population at that time. So if we transplant then, it makes it rather difficult to figure out if you had either a beneficial or a detrimental effect. So we were particularly interested in terms of pushing this timeline later, thinking ahead to what the potential might be um, in the human clinical trial setting. So I'm gonna give you a couple of definitions for terms here. Acute, for, um, for our purposes, I'm defining as immediately after injury. There are a lot of reasons from a um, clinical point of view, you might wanna transplant then, right at the time when you do stabilization surgery. So you gotta understand what's happening. Subacute in that sort of seven to 10 days after injury kind of time frame, and chronic, which for our purposes, um, we've defined as early chronic at about 30 days post-injury. The FDA likes to see 60 days post-injury to think about the chronic period. 
So why else does that matter? Well, in 2008, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, with whom I do um, quite a lot of work, did uh, with the CDC one of the first prospective, I think really the first prospective survey of spinal cord injury in the United States. Sort of like getting called for a presidential poll. They went out, they uh, worked on uh, developing a questionnaire and uh, developing the resources to be able to call a randomly selected uh, number of several thousand households in the US to do a survey. And one of the questions they asked is, does anyone living in this residence have a spinal cord injury? How did it happen? At what age did it happen? And so on. The big thing that came out of that is that our estimates of the number of individuals in the United States living with a spinal cord injury went from 250,000, which it had been previously, to 1.3 million based on this survey. Many more people living with spinal cord injury than had been captured in the previous information from the National Neural Trauma Centers. Well, that's important, it's not shown on this graph, because the numbers for what spinal cord injury costs the United States are about $40 billion a year. That's in 1997 injuries. As you all know, just because of the incredible um, impact that there is in terms of quality of life, loss of work, and the medical expenses that go along with it. So while the incidence was revised up, it was also true that the numbers that we're working with in terms of what spinal cord injury may cost for real doll dollar figures, we have to revise up as well. And that raises it up our list of priorities, I think, which is very important to think about um, looking for repair. There we go. So I want to say um, just a word about how we do these studies and why we do them this way. Um, a quick comment, this is a mouse, we use a lot of mice and rats for our studies. We have done this work in many different kinds of animal models, um, mice, rats, immunosuppressed mice, immunodeficient mice, immunosuppressed rats, immunodeficient rats. I want to just say um, uh, a word about this. We're transplanting human cells into a mouse. That's what's called a xenograft. It's a cross species. So it's very, very hard to get good cell survival with conventional immunosuppression. If you were to receive a stem cell transplant, it would be allogeneic, human to human, or even potentially as reprogrammed cells come along, your stem cells back into your body. And that drastically changes what we need to think about in terms of whether your immune system is gonna reject those cells. So we wanted to do this work, taking that variable out of the equation entirely, as was done with bone marrow transplant research um, early on, which was really the first stem cell therapy to get into clinical application. So we use a special kind of mouse generally and a special kind of rat that are sort of like boy in a bubble rodents. So they lack a normal immune system. They can't mount an efficient response against the human cells we're putting in. So we get very, very good cell survival. And we feel like that means we can really look at what the potential of these cells is more closely to how they would behave in terms of transplanting in, into humans. We also made a couple of other decisions early on, and we've investigated, I'll tell you a little bit at the end, a lot of these different parameters now. We transplanted away from the injury site, above and below, four sites. We also tried to do very atraumatic transplants. So what I mean by that is we tried not to cause any extra injury by virtue of doing the transplants. So each of these sites has only 250 nanoliters of volume in it. That's incredibly small in a mouse spinal cord. We only put in 75,000 cells total. That's a really, really small number in terms of thinking about these transplants. And then uh, after injury, we did that at various times, immediately uh, subacute, whoops, subacutely or uh, at 30 or I'll, I'll just tell you 60 days post-injury. Um, and then we looked what happens in terms of what those cells became and um, in other words, what did they become neurons or oligodendrocytes or astrocytes? What did they, astrocytes, what did they differentiate into? Where did they go and what was the impact in terms of recovering? I'm not gonna tell you anything about these acute transplants today. I'm only gonna focus on the nine and 30 day post-injury. So if we look at that, Okay, this is really annoying. If we look at that, um, everything that you see labeled here in brown is a human cell. So this is a mouse that got stem cell transplants. Here's the epicenter right there. And they got transplants in two sites above, two sites below, as we talked about. And this is four and a half months after they received those cells. So everything that you see labeled in brown is a human cell. This is an example of what those cells look like just 48 hours after transplant. You can see the injection site, but you also see a lot of cells starting to migrate out. And that's one of the big characteristics um, that we've seen here. If we look at where they go, 
One thing that was very promising to us early on is that when they go into white matter, where the wiring and the insulation is, they look a lot like oligoden oligodendrocytes, which we wanted to see. And when they go into gray matter, they listen to the cues that are there and they really become neurons. And so we don't see these cells taking on any fates, any differentiation characteristics that would put the wrong cell in the wrong place at the wrong time. Everything looks good about that. There we go. So I'm going to um, skip through this a little bit and not um, talk about this picture so much, just tell you what they became. It turns out in this subacute environment, so nine days post-injury, the majority of cells, almost 65%, became insulating cells, became oligodendrocytes. A smaller number, about 25%, became neurons. We saw almost none of these cells become astrocytes. And this was really different from um, what we've seen with other cell populations and, and what other investigators have published. Rather than um, looking at the details of this, where is the projector? Because it's just not going. Um, I just want to give you an idea of what these cells look like in that environment. So a stem cell, if you think about it, could stay hunkered down and small. But if it's going to be functional, we think that it might have to reach out and contact the other cells that are in its environment. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. So this labeled in red is a human cell. Everything that's around here in green alone is a mouse cell that's present. And so you can see that these cells are really reaching out into the environments that they're in and contacting a lot of mouse cells. So this is an example of a human cell, again, that's shown in red, that's differentiated into an oligodendrocyte. And this is exactly what we expect those insulating cells to look like if they're doing their job in the brain and spinal cord. So what about recovery of function? So this is an example of one of these mice I've talked about. It's going to play in slow motion in just a moment. What I want you to notice is that she can't take steps with her hind limb all the time. She takes a lot more forelimb steps. Can everybody see that? She's missing, 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 and here she's going. A normal mouse should be one-to-one, -one, forelimbs and hind limbs. But she can't step consistently. In fact, she only steps occasionally. And she has no coordination. She has no ability to move her forelimbs and hind limbs in a coordinated fashion, the way that a mouse would have to, to be uh, in the wild. And this is a mouse that receives stem cell transplants about eight weeks after transplantation. So now you can see that this animal is stepping consistently with her hind limbs, she doesn't miss any steps, and she's one to one to one to one in terms of her forelimb and hind limb steps. So this animal has regained consistent stepping, and she's also regained uh, normal coordination in this example. That's a big functional recovery in terms of what we can expect in rodents. So if we graph, oops, if we graph that out, if we graph that out, I think we need new batteries in this. There we go. Um, if we graph that out, it looks like this. So this is one type of testing that we do. It's called an open field test. And these are the animals in blue that received human neural stem cells. These are the animals in green um, that just received vehicle. We can also put in other stem cell populations. I'll talk about that in a second. And that made us ask the question, well, how is this working? Remember, we posed at the beginning the idea that um, stem cells might be able to do many things, not just integrate into the nervous system to replace cells, but maybe convince the mouse nervous system to do something better on its own. And so we went looking for whether or not these cells showed examples of actually connecting up within the environment we put them in. And sure enough, we were able to find, um, doing some specialized techniques, that mouse uh, uh, axons were becoming myelinated by the human cells that we had transplanted, and also even that the human cells that we transplanted were making synapses, in other words, functional connections like this circuitry, the wiring we're talking about, um, that might be able to send signals where it wasn't possible to send signals before. So if that's true, if they're integrating, as we say, then the prediction we would make is that once these animals had reached stable plateau, if we took away the cells that had become functional, then we should lose the recovery. Right? If they had just tweaked, if they had cajoled, if they had convinced the mouse nervous system to do its own job better, then taking away the human cells at that point shouldn't matter. Does that track make sense for everybody? So what we did is to work out a way to take away, to ablate, only the human cells. And we did that with a compound called diphtheria toxin, which is about 100,000-fold more toxic to human cells than it is to mouse cells. 
And we showed in a dish that we could selectively kill human cells using uh, particular doses. And then we went ahead and did that experiment. When these animals were at functional plateau, we selectively ablated. We really did. We ablated the human cells. <laughs> and what we saw is that the animals lost their recovery of function. And so this demonstrates that the survival of the human cells is absolutely critical for the functional recovery. And it very strongly suggests that it's integration of those cells um, that's yielding the recovery. So uh, yeah. So that's cell population specific. So this is a different kind of behavioral test we can do where we're looking at the number of errors. We see that there's a reduction in errors with increase in the number of cells that are engrafted when we use human neural stem cells. In contrast, the opposite is true when we transplant a control population like human fibroblasts. So not only do the animals not get better, in fact, they get worse when we put in fibroblasts in this particular paradigm. So let's come back to this issue in my uh, timing uh, question. Is timing everything? So this is during this subacute period. What about from a more chronic perspective, right? For all the reasons we talked about, incidents of, in other words, the number of people that are living with spinal cord injury in the chronic setting, the ability to be able to think about um, doing a clinical trial that's not just safety, but also efficacy, as Stephen's going to tell you about. We're very interested in pushing this timeline later, even though a very cogent argument had made, uh, been made that it couldn't be done. So again, the prediction here was that these cells wouldn't be able to survive. But in fact, if we look at transplants nine day or 30 days post-injury, again, everything that you see labeled in brown is a human cell. Survival was not our issue here, nor was migration. These cells integrated very, very well. And if, in fact, um, we looked at what these cells became, this is just to give you an idea of what sorts of things we have to do to be able to um, visualize that, and we count up those cells, we see that, again, it's these two columns together that add up. The majority of these cells became oligodendrocytes, became insulating cells. An increased, but a smaller number of them became neurons. Very, very few of them became astrocytes, which is something that we wanted to see in this environment. And then the question of integration. Did they really make uh, uh, things that could improve function like myelin, like insulation in this environment? And what I just want to point out here are the yellow dots. This is lost in the context of spinal cord injury. When you lose the insulation, you lose the expression of a protein called Casper that helps the signal jump down axons as it goes. And in animals that receive stem cell transplants, we've restored this. Um, and so it suggests, again, that the cells are functionally integrating within this environment. This parallel question is what happens in terms of locomotor recovery of function. I won't show you the videos again, but again, we see that animals in blue um, showed an improvement, and probably it's easy to see, easiest to see in this graph down here. So blue is animals that received human neural stem cells, green is our vehicle control, and this is the number of animals that showed improved coordination. So about threefold number of animals were able to exhibit consistent stepping and coordination when they received human neural stem cell transplants. So fast forward, what does that mean in terms of getting over to the other side? Well, if your basic science meets translational science and has a chance of living happily ever after, you actually take that first finding and you do a lot more work. So this is a sample of the additional studies that we've done using different models, longer delays, rats instead of mice, animals that cavitate in order to be able to support the safety and efficacy findings to go forward into a human clinical trial that Stephen's going to tell you about in just a minute. And so the sorts of things you have to consider, and I thought this would be a good place to end to just set him up for the next phase, are things like scale. This is a human brain and spinal cord. This is a rat brain and spinal cord and a mouse brain and spinal cord. You can see that this is very different in terms of what we have to think about for the cells being able to migrate or go out and go in and do repair. And then this is kind of a long list of things that people in the field have talked about being important considerations for thinking about translational therapies. And I've highlighted in blue, in reality, all of the ones that we have looked at um, to be able to go on uh, to the next stages in my lab. And this includes timing the niche and cell dose, allodynia, that means whether you're doing harm in the sense of potentially inducing pain, 
multiple models, of the, the transplantation locus, in other words, where do you transplant the cells, what's the base, best thing to do, how they migrate, how they proliferate, long-term safety, looking at issues of immunosuppression, do immunosuppressants alter cell fate, what are the consequences of a, a xenograft human to mouse versus an allograft human to human. And looking at endpoints um, in terms of spinal cord injury and how one could get to doing an effective clinical trial. So, for example, this is work that the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation has funded extensively. Looking ahead to when you finally go to clinical trial, how are we going to be able to determine if people got better or got worse? And so, of course, like everything else in science, we kind of stand on the shoulders of people that have gone before us. And it's one reason that we were um, highly interested in the University of Zurich as a site because they've really been at the forefront of these measures, which is a great place to end because it sets you up for what Stephen is going to tell you next. So I'll stop there.